Our next guest says NVIDIA's move on to Intel Stir makes a lot of strategic sense. Let's bring in Jared Weisfeld, tech sector specialist at Jefferies. Jared, good to see you again. Good to be here. Thanks, why, Melissa. Why is going after this niche market so important? Well, I think it speaks to what NVIDIA is focused on over the next five to 15 years, right? They're in the middle of acquiring ARM or trying to for $40 billion. They know the battle for the data center is at risk. And by acquiring ARM, they're going to get access to a lot of this critical technology, but they don't need to, you know, they're showing the innovation that's occurring before they're even getting through this acquisition. So you think about the benefits that they're talking about, they're talking about 10 times improved performance utilizing their own Grace CPU combined with their own accelerators, their GPUs. That's a meaningful, that's a meaningful amount. So, you know, you start with a niche segment like HPC, uh, high performance compute and AI artificial intelligence. And then what you do is you build credibility before you start going into the larger total addressable market. So it makes a lot of sense. And it also makes a lot of sense that they're partnering with Amazon. They're partnering with MediaTek. They're partnering with Marvell. As they're going through this regulatory process, it certainly makes sense to get as many friends as possible within the partner ecosystem. So it certainly speaks to the long-term structural growth within data center and how they're attacking the market from an ARM architecture perspective. Hey, hey, Jared, it's Tim. But does does this do anything or add complexity to the the antitrust uh, ar around NVIDIA ARM? I mean, is that something that you think uh, makes this deal more complicated? Obviously, uh, not challenging Intel or a challenge to Intel and data center. Uh, that's welcomed, I I'm sure, on some level by the industry. But to the overall dynamics going on between this, as you said, uh, takeover they're trying to get done, do you think this complicates that? I think, if anything, it can speak to the fact that they're innovating so aggressively within the ARM ecosystem. If you're a partner and you're seeing them innovate like this and deliver this kind of product roadmap, you're going to be happy. And they're courting, they're courting their partners. So I take that as an incremental positive in terms of just the progress that they're trying to make uh, with respect to regulatory. I think the big hurdle is going to be China. Can they get SAMR approval? You saw Applied Materials uh, and Kokusai got yeah. rejected from China a few weeks ago. So I think, you know, it, this is going to be a long, drawn-out process. They laid out about an 18-month timeline, so we're still very early days, but I think it's an incremental step in the right direction as they secure partner ecosystem uh, approval. Hey, hey, Jared, it's Dan. Um, thanks for joining us, bud. Hey, so um, as far as semi-equipment stocks uh, go, how would you see this changing any of the deck chairs that are set up? We know that Taiwan Semi keeps raising their cap back, so there's some major tailwinds right, ha right now. How would NVIDIA's entrance into this market and the closure of the ARM deal, uh, what does it mean for semi-cap equipment stocks, any pr in particular either? For sure. When you take a step back and you look at the semiconductor uh, capital equipment landscape, including applied materials, KLA 10 core, et cetera, they're in a very good position right now. When you think about the fact that we're in a significant shortage, we obviously had the summit at the White House today uh, with uh, multiple executives from the automotive industry and the semiconductor industry talking about uh, when they can alleviate that shortage. It plays into the fact that, you know, we're going to be in shortage for at least the next six to nine months. So cyclically, they're in a very good spot. But it's an interesting question, Dan, because from a structural standpoint, you think about artificial intelligence and HPC type workloads, they're gonna be using and leveraging silicon that's significantly larger in nature on a millimeter square basis. So what that means is that the demand for semiconductor capital equipment, uh, the intensity is only gonna increase. So this is no doubt a long-term structural positive tailwind for the entire semiconductor capital equipment landscape. It sounds like you think there's more upside to semi-cap equipment as opposed to semiconductors. They're just in a very um, sweet spot right now, not only from the cyclical benefit. And if you listen to Applied Materials Analyst Day that was hosted uh, last week, they talked about $85 billion in wafer fab equipment spend uh, over the next few years. And, you know, you also have multinationals, right? You have China, you have the U.S., you have Europe looking to add capacity from a, from a national perspective in terms of just nation-backed uh, foundries. So th they've got very significant talents at their backs. All right. And, and while we have you, Jared, got to get your quick thoughts on, on Microsoft for Nuance. What do you think of this? So, yeah, listen, uh, second largest acquisition um, in, uh, in Microsoft's history behind LinkedIn. And it's all about augmenting their total addressable market. So augmenting Microsoft Healthcare Cloud, they're doubling their TAM, their total addressable market to $500 billion, combining Nuance's AI algorithms with Microsoft's leadership in Azure on the cloud side. And so not only are they attacking the healthcare market in a pretty meaningful way, leveraging the existing Microsoft capabilities, but they're bringing very significant and critical IP towards Microsoft Teams. 
So if you think about Microsoft Teams, which is the competitor to Slack, they're, Microsoft's all in on Teams to the point where even Satya Nadella's comp package is now based on Teams performance. So they're going all in, increasing and augmenting the capabilities from a team standpoint, and they're going to be able to integrate that seamlessly with, uh, with Nuance. So I think it makes a lot of strategic sense. All right, Jared, great to see you. Thanks for your thoughts. Thank you. Jared Weisfeld. I think that's, that was interesting in terms of Satya Nadella's compensation is tied to Teams, and what would that mean to not just the Slack, but also to a Zoom, let's say. Dan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty sneaky little acquisition here. You know, $20 billion with debt and everything like that. It's a rounding error on Microsoft's, uh, you know, market cap and even on their balance sheet. Um, and I think Jared laid it out why they're doing it here. They're adding some capabilities. Azure is becoming uh, more and more of a competitor. That's one of the reasons why Microsoft's almost a $2 trillion market cap. So to me, this makes sense. They can, they can basically do whatever they want. They were looking at the TikTok. They were looking at Discord. They were looking at a few things. This this one, it's like literally 1% of their sales, but it means so much more to them if it's done properly and gives them the access to some of these markets where they think they can flex with their cloud. Yeah, they wanted to do something. It was a, it was very, very apparent. And Karen, maybe the, the biggest tell is the movement or the lack of movement in Microsoft stock in response to this deal. Right. Well, if you think about it, it's an all cash deal. So they had cash sitting on the sidelines, basically earning nothing. And they could buy this, which is strategically really important. They said it would be uh, dilutive 1% in the first year and then accretive thereafter. And it still, there would be no change in the company's $20 billion buyback. So to Dan's point, you know, they can do whatever they want. This, uh, uh, this makes sense to me. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.